Warning, this first clip has a few expletives in it, so you may not want to watch with your kids around. Easy. Oh, hi there. Uh, I'm calling about your, um, the Hensvik uh, baby crib. No, 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 there's, there's no problem with it. I think the biggest issue that I'm having right now is that the, the crib has, didn't come assembled. There's just an enormous amount of hardware that has, that's come with this unit. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm having a real hard time, you know, putting this thing together. All right, Peter. Swedish for fuck you. Uh, well, besides a slow descent into alcoholism, I'm just really having trouble finding all the screws and the pieces that go with it. I mean, there's got to be over 100,000 pieces that came with it. So I'm just wondering if there's a representative or, or five that could come by and make this happen for me. Fuck. And a good day to you, too. Thank you. Sometimes managing a medical diagnosis and all of the equipment and prescriptions and doctor's appointments can be really overwhelming to a patient. Kind of as overwhelming as an IKEA instruction manual. And it's our job as nurses to make the information accessible and understandable for the patients so they can accurately and safely self-manage their care. Today we're going to talk all about patient education. So Hope, go ahead and get out your two textbooks, both your Giddens uh, and your Davis chapters. We'll be working in both of your texts today. And for this lesson, you're gonna complete Concept Study Guide version A, and you're going to accomplish these objectives. So go ahead and pause here, take a look at these objectives, and then we'll move on to the next slide. So let's go ahead and start by defining and describing the concept of patient education. So let's define and describe this concept. Patient education is anything that the patient needs in terms of knowledge or skills, understanding, to be able to make informed choices about their care and be able to care for themselves at home, either managing a diagnosis of a disease or just keeping themselves healthy and, and obtaining wellness. And the, con the term patient teaching is interchangeable with patient education. They just mean the same thing. Now patient education is goal oriented. We, we want to achieve something with this education. It's not just about checking it off on our list of, yep, we, we educated our patient. No, we really wanna get something out of this for the patients. And really the goal is empowerment and, and helping people to take control of their health. And we do this and we're gonna see hopefully changes in behavior, enhanced health and well-being, and improved treatment of illness. And so we really have goals and reasons why we educate our patients. Now the scope of the concept includes two things, the delivery approach, how we teach, and the educational domains, meaning what kind of education are they learning? And the educational approach can be anything from formal to informal, group to individual education, or it can even be self-directed. Now, in terms of self-directed education, we know that the internet is an incredible resource for all of us in our everyday lives and can give us information at the press of a button, and that includes health information. But we need to teach our patients how to access good internet resources because evaluating source material is very important. Not everything on the internet is true. We all know this, right? And so we need to help our patients, educate our patients on where they get their internet resources from. Oftentimes government resources are going to be very reliable, sites should have active linked and considered links and be considered credible. In, in terms of what I like to reference for my patients, the CDC website is great, the WHO, World Health Organization, and also the Mayo Clinic has a really nice patient friendly uh, site for an education um, and it's vetted and it's reliable 
great sources of information. So when patients say, I Googled it, make sure you ask them where they got their information from and teach them how to source reliable information. Now there are three learning domains that um, patients are gonna be educated in. The cognitive domain is increasing head knowledge. The psychomotor domain is using our hands to develop or improve a skill. And the effective is changing or influencing attitudes. So it's learning for your head, for your hands, or for your heart. And these are the same domains that we're learning in nursing school. We're learning theory, we're learning hands-on skill, and we're learning the heart of nursing that drives what you do. And it's those same three domains that we use to teach our patients. Now, in terms of attributes and criteria, we want to remember that teaching is planned. It's intentional. And so we need to plan to know what the education needs to be and what learning outcome we want to achieve. In other words, what do you want the patient to get out of this teaching? And hopefully the patient is motivated to learn because learning is a two-way street. So I could talk to you all day on YouTube, but if you're not motivated to learn and study it, you're not going to learn anything from my teaching. And it's the same way with our patients. We can provide them all the training and education, but if they're not motivated to learn it, they're not gonna get anything out of it. So it really is a two-way street when it comes to patient teaching. And thank you, by the way, for being such a motivated learner. It really is a pleasure to study with you. So I don't think we can talk about learning and patient teaching and education without talking about some learning theories that really drive the understanding of how people learn and how to teach. So the first uh, model is something we've talked about already and it's the health belief model. And that means the patient's belief that they're susceptible to a disease, that the belief that the disease can be avoided by changing uh, behaviors, and the belief that the patient thinks that they can make a difference, that they can do it. So if you have a patient with diabetes and they don't believe it's affecting them poorly, um, they don't believe there's anything they can do about it no matter what, it's just destined for it to be this way, and they don't think that they're capable of giving themselves insulin injections, we're not gonna be able to get very far with their education. So they need to believe they're susceptible to the illness, that there's something they can do to fix it, and that they're capable of doing that action. Now the health promotion model, on the other hand, developed by Pender, talks about focusing on wellness, optimizing wellness rather than avoiding disease. And patient motivation is definitely influenced by social support and competing priorities. Patients' perceptions of the benefit and the ability to succeed affect the outcomes. I think for health promotion model, Weight Watchers is an excellent example of health promotion model. They use social support group meetings each week and they focus on wellness and driving towards feeling better inside and out. And they talk about how do you manage competing priorities in your life, busyness, sickness, holidays, stress. They talk about how do you manage those by st but still driving towards health. So Weight Watchers is an exact excellent example of the health promotion model. Now, one more uh, theory to discuss is the self-care deficit theory. Created by Dorothea Oram, it talks about optimizing the patient's ability to assume responsibility for his or her own care. Self-care is defi defined as purposeful action performed in sequence with a pattern. Teaching things like checking your blood pressure at home, checking your blood sugar at home, uh, teaching parents for chronic kids to know how to suction their children at home, using a CPAP breathing machine at night. It's these things that we teach to be able for the patient to self-care for themselves. And when the patient's unable to care for themselves, considering the role the family has in helping to provide care. So with our tr education, we're really teaching our patients to provide excellent self-care for themselves with whatever that means for their life. So I think at this point, we have a pretty good understanding that 
education is a big important thing to do for uh, healthcare and that nurses play a role in that. But we need to know when and how to apply patient education to the specific context of nursing and to healthcare. So remember that patient education is in our scope of practice from the American Nursing Association. It's a core and vital foundational role that we provide and we need to be good at it. Because as long as you're working in any setting as a nurse that involves patient care, you're gonna be doing patient education. So this is a competency that we need to get good at right away and maintain as a competency throughout our career. So we talk a lot about the six rights of medication administration. Well, there's five rights for teaching. The right time. So if a patient's sleeping in the middle of the night and I wake them up, it's probably not a great time to educate them on something. The right context. Is it the right setting and the right time um, to, to provide that teaching? So if a patient just got um, a diagnosis of cancer, it may not be the right time to start teaching them immediately two minutes later about that diagnosis and just kind of let them have that moment. The right goal. What is your teach? Your teaching needs to have a specific goal in mind that the patient comes away with. The right content. What do you need to tell them? We don't want to give them too much information. That's like drinking from a fire hose. You just can't possibly retain it all but too little information and they won't have the tools that they need to provide self-care. So we need to find that sweet spot of the right amount of content and the appropriate content for their needs. And then finally, the right method. We use a lot of methods um, in teaching. You can use written information, you can use videos, you can have teach back where you teach the patient something and then they pretend to teach it back to you. And you can do return demonstration where you demonstrate something and then they demonstrate it back to you. So based on the kind of information you're sharing, you'll need to choose the right method for delivery. Now your Davis text has a variety of helpful um, information on other factors that affect patient learning. So go ahead and pause here and read this out for yourself. It's also located in your Davis text. The page numbers are at the bottom. Now we're going to apply the nursing process to patient education. And so that starts with assessment. And you need to get a good assessment on who your learner is, uh, their education level, their literacy level, their social support at home, what resources do they have available, their developmental level. We're gonna teach a child differently than you would teach an adult, certainly and their cultural background. All of these things play into the readiness of a learner and their ability to learn, and we need to have a good understanding of that. So your uh, Giddens text also talks about other factors that affect learning. Specifically, I wanna highlight the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Remember, if patients don't have their basic needs met, they're not going to be in a position to learn things. So you want to make sure that you've, you've met all of their basic needs. For example, a patient in the ER who's extremely short of breath, they're diaphoretic, meaning they're sweaty, and they're just struggling to catch a breath. Probably not a good time to teach them how to use an inhaler. They're just not in a place to learn that when they're still focused on those, those physiologic needs. So consider Maslow's as you consider the timing and the context for when learning should occur. Moving on to the next two phases of the nursing process, planning and implementation. So planning, you need to determine what methods you're going to use to teach. And what methods you're gonna use are gonna be influenced by the domain used to achieve the outcome. What I mean by that is if you're teaching a hands-on skill, like teaching someone to give themselves an, an EpiPen, then you need to do a hands-on teaching method. So if you need to teach them how to use an EpiPen, you're not gonna hand them a piece of paper that talks about it. You're gonna get out a practice EpiPen, you're gonna show them how to do that, and then they're gonna show you how to do that. So the type of teaching needs to match what you're trying to get out of the teaching. And then in terms of implementation, um, you wanna consider when is it appropriate for you? When do you have the time um, to teach them properly? And also on the condition of the patient and when they're ready to receive that learning. 
So here are the components of a teaching plan. This is all outlined for you in Davis. The strategies, what method are you going to use to prevent the, present the information? The content, what information are you going to include? The scheduling and the sequence, how to organize and sequence the information. And then finally, the instructional material, the format, and very importantly, the reading level. When I worked in the ER, we made sure that all of our discharge education uh, materials were written at a fifth grade reading level. And there's reading level tools that you can pull up on the internet and add your resources to, and it'll tell you what the reading level is for that material. But you wanna keep things nice and simple so that that is not a barrier to patients learning. In terms of evaluating, you wanna make sure the patients get it, right? It's not good enough just to provide the information. You have to make sure that they understood it and are able to use it. And so make sure that the evaluation is consistent with the type of learning being taught. So some things we use are like teach back, where I'm gonna tell someone, for example, how to follow a low salt diet. And then I'm going to say, okay, Mr. Smith, if you were on, if you were me and you were teaching about a low salt diet, pretend you're going to teach me about that low salt diet. And then by doing that, I can make sure he really understands that information. And then finally, documentation. You're going to document everything that you teach to a patient. We need to get credit for our work, and education's a big thing that we do. So remember, if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. So make sure you document um, you know, that, that patients were educated, how you educated them, and their ability to demonstrate that they understood the materials. Now, there are a number of things that are interrelated concepts with patient education, and they really do interplay and interact with each other. And you can see those here. Finally, here are some exemplars, some examples of how nursing's uh, complete patient education on a regular basis. Now keep in mind, anytime you're working with patients, you're going to be teaching. But these are some main areas that we teach in. So patient teaching. Hopefully we can help patients have their medical care and information be a little more manageable than an IKEA instruction manual. That's our job. And I know you're up to the task. See you in class. Thanks for listening.